and welcome to another episode of Politics and Pints. I'm your co-host Mike Jackman and I'm very excited today. Um, I am joined by author, journalist, uh, professor at Brown University, Professor Stephen Kinzer. How are you doing today? Now that I'm here, I'm doing great. Cold beer, you know, foreign policy. Uh, Good combination. Potential with war with Iran. Things are great, right? So I want to start, I want to start with Iran or Iran or however the, how do you pronounce it? Iran? Iran would be just as well. And, and that's what I wish uh, some people in America would do from it. Iran, away from it. Don't plunge into it. Yeah, exactly. Like, like we were saying earlier, I'm sorry that we put all of our military bases around your country. But I think it's timely because you've been writing about um, Iran and regime change and our involvement in the Middle East for a very long time. Um, one of the reasons why I, I, I'm so excited to put this interview together is uh, I, I read your book Overthrow back in college, uh, back in 2006, and you were going through 100 years of regime change that America's been involved in and arming rebels or doing the actual dirty itself, um, even talking about uh, Hawaii and other places. So the situation in Iran right now, if we go back to 1950, do you think we need to go back to 1953 to explain to people you know, why we are where we are, where we are currently? It's always important to look at how we get to a place. You know, uh, before evolution was understood, there were a lot of theories about how life began. And one of my favorites, which was believed by the ancient Greeks, was called spontaneous generation. It meant that there'd just be a pile of stuff and it'd be sunny and it'd be wet and the next thing you know, animals would just start springing out of it. This is the way Americans look at world crises. They just generate spontaneously. They're not caused by anything except for the inherent craziness of the people who live everywhere outside the United States. Actually, this isn't true. In geopolitics, just like in physics, causes have effects and events are caused by things. So let's try to walk the cat back, as they say in the CIA. That's a great CIA expression, particularly when an operation goes badly. They walk the cat back. So what happened before that and before that and before that? Let's walk the cat back um, on Iran. So uh, if you go back to the period at the beginning of the 20th century, Iran was in the midst of a constitutional revolution. Iran had a constitution more than 100 years ago. There are other countries in the Middle East that don't have a constitution even today. Um, the United States intervened to destroy democracy in Iran in 1953 because the government of Prime Minister Mossadegh, responding to the will of the Iranian people, nationalized Iran's oil industry. That brought the Shah back into power. The Shah ruled with increasing brutality and repression for 25 years. That repression brought about the explosion of the late 1970s, what we call the Islamic Revolution. That's what brought to power the current regime in Iran. And that revolution in 1979 also had terrible other effects. One of the other effects was it caught the attention of Iran's biggest enemy, Saddam Hussein, right next door in Iraq. So he decided he would invade Iran. That triggered the Iran-Iraq war, the longest war of the 20th century, eight years. And that's what brought the United States into a death embrace with Saddam, because we sided with Saddam against Iran. That's the beginning of the whole Iraq project that we're involved in. And the Islamic Republic Revolution of 1979 also terrified the Soviets, because they were afraid Islamic radicalism would be penetrating into the Soviet Union through the southern republics. That's why the Soviets invaded Afghanistan and brought us into the trap we are in there. So a lot of history came from a few weeks in August in 1953 when the United States sent a CIA team to Iran to destroy that country's democracy. It's really crazy to think about. Um, it was it Teddy Roosevelt's grandson, Kermit, or was it? That's it, right. Okay, so Teddy Roosevelt, one of our presidents, his grandson, Kermit Roosevelt, well, according to your work, was only in Iran for, what, three weeks? And he, he, he was one of the guys, along with the Dulles brothers, who really kind of led the operation. I wonder sometimes if it was in the uh, Roosevelt family DNA, because, of course, Teddy Roosevelt, as president, uh, was essentially the guy who ushered America into the regime change project with the wars in Cuba and taking over the Philippines. So then, flash forward half a century, 
His grandson, Kermit Roosevelt, becomes the CIA officer who is sent to Iran to overthrow Iranian democracy and succeeds in doing that in the summer of 1953. Along with uh, General Schwarzkopf's father, right? That's Which right. I didn't know that. I didn't know that until father was recently. also involved. I want Schwarzkopf. He, and the, <laughs> like uh, the connections, you know? Absolutely. The ghouls carry over from generation to generation. And uh, if that 1979 revolution had not happened, if the U.S. had not intervened in Iran in 1953 to set in motion the processes that created that revolution, we might have had a thriving democracy in the heart of the Muslim Middle East all these 70 years. And I can hardly wrap my mind around how different the Middle East would now look. But the fact is, if you go all the way back to the first Ottoman constitution in the 1870s, every single time a country in the Middle East has tried to establish democracy or self-rule, Westerners have crashed in to stop it. And then we look at the Middle East and say, oh, they're in such chaos they can't govern themselves. If we had left them alone, they might be a lot further along. Yeah, probably. I mean, we, we helped uh, Saddam in Iraq, what, in the 50s or 60s? With Absolutely. His, with his rise, and then that, that, came, that and, Frankenstein came back. You know, uh, so just these two countries alone, uh, as an impetus in the Middle East, have, have caused us so many problems. When I was writing my book, Overthrow, to which you referred, I was assembling photographs, and you may not know this, but authors are supposed to pay for uh, the photos in the book. Um, and so I assembled a lot of pictures, but there were two pictures that were really expensive to get, and it made me think that maybe people don't want those pictures around so much. One was Donald Rumsfeld with Saddam. Oh yeah, shaking hands. Shaking hands, because they were pals. And the uh, that's other- That's a great photo, it's kind of blurry though. It is. And the other one that got very expensive was uh, CIA Director George H.W. Bush in a friendly meeting with Manuel Noriega from oh, yeah. Panama. Oh, he was his boy. He was his boy till he wasn't. Yeah, well, uh, when was Panama? 1989. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, well, that was. I mean, Jesus, long Panama. There's another one. So, so flashing forward to today, 2020, uh, President Donald Trump. It seems like he was given a few different options with Iran, and he chose the most extreme. Uh, why do you think it was that he wanted to launch that, that assassination? I think a lot of it has to do with ignorance. The person who was the victim of that assassination, uh, General Soleimani, is the number one ISIS killer in the world. There's nobody who, who's killed more ISIS guerrillas than he has. And he has a real reason, and so do Iranians have a real reason to be against ISIS. ISIS has, as one of its fundamental principles, just like Al-Qaeda does, kill every Shiite. That means they want to kill every person in Iran. So that, we would say, gives Iran a slight incentive to want to make sure they don't come to power in a country right next door. If we were truly interested in wiping out ISIS, he could have been a partner for us. But we don't want to do anything that is going to stabilize regimes in the Middle East unless we're sure those regimes are going to be subservient to us. In Syria, it's the same principle. The best way to contain radicalism in Syria is to support a strong central government that has an army. But we don't want that because we know that strong central government is not going to support us. So could Suleimani have been a person that we might have been able to deal with to try to see if we could make out a different kind of relationship with Iran? Maybe, but we didn't do it because we don't want a better relationship with Iran. We want to crush them. So we're not interested in anything that is going to produce stability in any environment in which current governments stay in power. So by sowing this kind of chaos and carrying out these kind of killings, we're actually not only intensifying upheaval in the Middle East, but undermining our own security. Absolutely. And, and, and uh, late last year, they discovered over 50 billion barrels of oil in the southern region of Iran. Um, how do you think that plays into this whole deal? My favorite quote <clears throat> of all during the run up to the Iraq war was one from Donald Rumsfeld, which I have committed to memory. This war has nothing to do with oil, literally nothing to do with oil. So that was the biggest triple Pinocchio of, of that uh, Pinocchio heavy uh, war project. And I think it's crazy to believe that any big power ever sets policies towards the Middle East without thinking about oil. Of course, of course. And, 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 and they publicly announced that, I think, in like September or something. So, if, so if, to suggest that, that, that this general was such a huge threat and was killing Americans, and of course, it's more nuanced than that when you're looking at all the fighting that's going on over there than just a slogan that can go on a bumper sticker. Um, 
But to suggest that it's just because Americans are threatened or our troops in that region, wouldn't they have done that a lot sooner? He never threatened anybody in this country. He never carried out any acts or threatened to carry out any acts in this country. He was not a threat to you or to me. No. He was only a threat to American military forces that are in and around his country. Now, by our definition, particularly in the Middle East, any person who takes up arms against the U.S. military or any of our affiliated partners is a terrorist. Now, we might call those people patriots or nationalists if we were there, but by this definition, the uh, Minutemen at Lexington and Concord would terrorists. definitely have been terrorists. So the definition of terrorism is pretty elastic. First, we decide who we want to demonize, then we come up with some way to try to tie him to something and we can call him a terrorist. Well, I mean, Reagan called the Mujahideen freedom fighters back in the 80s, right? Didn't he have, the, have them in the White House for, he, for photo ops? And I mean, the Contras. Talk, talk about strange bedfellows. Remember, the Contras in Nicaragua are the equivalent of the uh, French resistance and our founding <laughs> fathers. I mean, there's no limit to the exaggerations we hear. In the, in Look, Stephen, Oliver North's a great guy, okay? He's a great friend of mine. I'm going to have him franchise a couple of KFCs down there. It's going to be great. So, um, so Mosaddegh, let's go back to 1953, yeah. and, you, and you see a lot of this rhetoric even today where um, communism is to blame for major problems. They essentially had, they had actually people who were paid or who were put there to astroturf and pretend to be Mosaddegh supporters and also say they were communists. So Kermit Roosevelt organized this coup in a very interesting way. Uh, he, he f tried to stage the coup, this was in August of 1953, and it failed. But rather than flee, he decided to stay and try again. He decided that if he could throw Tehran into chaos, uh, he might give the military who he had brought, whose commanders he had bribed, an excuse to say that Mossadegh had lost control of the country and the military had to step in. So he started out by doing something which if I were a CIA operative, I might also have thought of, which was he, he went to a guy who controlled a lot of street gangs, kind of a thug that ran the protection rackets in the vegetable market, and he paid this guy to turn out a mob. And he told him, I want you to tell your people, run through the streets of Tehran, break shop windows, uh, topple the statues, fire your guns into the mosques, and yell, we love communism and Mossadegh. But then he did something even cleverer, which I would not have thought of, and that is he hired another mob to attack that mob. So he had two <laughs> gangs that he was paying, neither one of which understood that they were in the employee of the right, CIA. They're just like puppets, kind of. And kinda... sure enough, the whole city was in complete chaos, and that allowed the military to give an excuse to say it was time we had to step in. So if that type of thing was going on in 1953, can you even imagine the shenanigans that are going on now? And then, and then to, to have those operations on the ground, then it gets filtered to the media, and then we see it. So it's like, how can any American have any idea of what's actually going on in that region of the world and with a, a clear perspective that's, that's not compromised by, by an agenda? Well, what ties these operations all together and ties them to today uh, is the assumption that the United States has to watch what's happening in every country, decide who we're for, and then crush the people that we don't like the idea that we should allow politics to unfold in other countries normally and just accept the results is something that would seem completely crazy to right. most people in Washington. Uh, we have this sense that we need to be in charge. We need to be dominant everywhere. But what we forget is every time you pick friends, you're always picking enemies also. We have spent decades accumulating so many enemies. We'd be much better off allowing politics to unfold and not insisting that everything come out the way we want and then bombing when it doesn't. So all, all great uh, empires have eventually fallen, you know, and, and, and with the election of Donald Trump, it's like, a, you know, something out of Back to the Future 2 or, or The Simpsons or uh, Idiocracy or something like that. Um, the, the over six trillion we spend in the Middle East, um, coupled with just the, the chaos in the world right now, do you, I mean, what do you... Where do you, where, where, America is, is this 200 and what, uh, 43 year old experiment roughly. So where do, you, where, do we go, where do we go from here? I mean, what do you see in the time since you've been doing this and, and the, the way things are going right now? Where, where, do, you, where do you project like I our I wonder overall? sometimes if what we're seeing happening to America is kind of karmic payback for everything we've done in the world all these yeah. years, that finally it's coming back to haunt us. You know, um, I think we got a very unrealistic view of the world as we developed uh, because we're so isolated. 
You know, most countries, for example, in Europe or in Asia, before they make any decisions on geopolitics, they have to think about the countries next to them. Before Austria does anything, it has to think, what's France going to say? What's Germany going to say? What's Italy going to say? Well, everybody's around us. In addition, so we don't have any of that. We just have stolid Canadians and happy Mexicans and declining fish stocks. We never had to worry about how to get along with others. Also, for so many years, we have been shielded from the consequences of our actions. No matter what we did in the world, we wouldn't suffer any retaliation. Nothing bad ever happened here. And even now, if we didn't have news media, we wouldn't even know that we were at war. It doesn't affect people at home. So uh, I do see uh, us in now in a moment of real tectonic global change. And uh, what, what I fear is this. Um, in the, the great historical assessments that Thucydides wrote of the Peloponnesian War, he came up with a very interesting observation. He said, big war, wars start when a large established power is challenged by a rising power. But the war is not launched by the rising power to overthrow the dominant power. It's usually launched by the dominant power that's right. afraid of losing its position. Yeah. That was more than 2,000 years ago. But I think I'm starting to see that replay here, that, are we, that we're not willing to accept a world in which we're only first among equals instead of dominating everything, and that we'd rather fight and bring the whole temple down like Samson rather than allow a world to emerge that we don't dominate. This is my great fear. That seems to be kind of the way a lot of the people in power are, are feeling about it and acting. I mean, in the last week or so, we've had a lot of major neocons from uh, the W. Bush years flare up in support of Trump, finally. Uh, you know, Wolfowitz, one of the architects of the Iraq war. Oh, Trump's presidential. He's finally doing the right thing. We're going to have all our regime change. Um, they, what do you think the implications of, of that will be on the 2020 election? Well, in America, particularly in this Washington bubble, there is absolutely no limit to the number of times you can be wrong uh, before you get sort of frozen out of public debate. No, you can be wrong about everything, and you're still a CNN commentator. You're still the deputy assistant secretary absolutely. of something. You're still a paid show. And in fact, it also works the opposite. Those people who were right, like the 75 IR scholars who signed a letter warning against the Iraq war never get jobs in Washington. They are frozen out. Frozen so being out. right is a guarantee you'll never work again, and being wrong is a guarantee that you can keep telling Americans to carry out the same kinds of operations. Uh, so you ask about 2020. Um, I think I'm going to take a position that's uh, different from most Americans. It's always a cliche to say that uh, Americans don't vote on foreign policy. And in fact, I recently read a survey saying that for many Americans, foreign policy isn't even in the top 10 of their concerns. But rather than sit in the corner and weep about this, I'm going to uh, counter it with my own uh, rebellion and decide I'm, I'm going to vote only on foreign policy. Okay, so I could be maybe the, one of like half a dozen people in America. So based on that, how do I see the presidential campaign? Um, I only see two candidates. Um, who have indicated a real willingness to challenge these crippling assumptions that lead us into these successive wars around the world, and those are Tulsi Gabbard and Bernie Sanders. So uh, I'd be happy to vote for either one of those. Um, and I, I want to talk, uh, make, make one other point about the importance of foreign policy, and it's this. So we're hearing a lot from Democratic presidential candidates about the great domestic programs they want to impose. They want to have Medicare for all, and they want to have free public universities, uh, none of which, of course, can be paid for without uh, cutting back on our military budget. Um, but realistically speaking, Congress is not going to approve most of those programs. You're not going to get a tax bill like what Bernie Sanders likes, not rather than the one that Donald Trump likes. Realistically, even if those people are elected, no matter who it is, those sweeping domestic programs that most Democrats talk about are not going to be implemented, certainly not on the scale that the candidates want. But foreign policy is different. In foreign policy, as we've seen with Trump, a president can have a huge impact. And that's why I think there's another incentive to look at foreign policy more seriously when you're deciding who to vote for uh, for president. Absolutely. And, and uh, you mentioned uh, Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard. She's 
There was a, something on Twitter or online, there was an article, she's mentioned Iran and foreign policy over 55 times, That's compared to the other candidates, like Buttigieg, I think, mentioned it once or twice. And, and that just shows you the, the perception that gets put out there about what's important and what we should be focusing on. And she talks about block granting a billion dollars for every state for just the Afghanistan war that we're paying for, four billion a month. So that turns out to roughly, I think, you know, close to 50 billion a year. And you could give each state a billion dollars. Start there, right? Well, I would have great confidence in her ability to do that. And Bernie also, I tell you, during the last presidential campaign in 2016, I still remember almost falling off my seat watching a debate between Bernie and Hillary Clinton, and Bernie Gossel goes on to a rap about Mossadegh. He says, nobody knows who Mossadegh was. President, Prime Minister of Iran, 1953. I thought, I don't believe it. I know. He's talking I know. about Mossadegh. So what I think sensitivity to the Mossadegh story means is not just that you have some idea of history, but it means that you have some consciousness that when you crash violently into the affairs of another country, that's going to have long-term effects. Right. And you should stop and think before you do it. The Iran story is a signal example of that. So when you care about it, to me, that's a sign that you're going to be very cautious before launching these other kinds of interventions. You know, when you intervene violently like this in another country, you're doing something like releasing a wheel at the top of a hill. You let it go. But that's it, you have no control over how it's gonna bounce or where it's gonna end up. And only American hubris and arrogance allows us to believe, don't worry, we can control where it's gonna go and if it lands in a bad place, we fix it. We don't care how many people have to lose their lives and how much infrastructure gets damaged and it, it, it's sad. But uh, no, it was great too in 2016 when Bernie was like, look, I, I, am, uh, I am not friends with Henry Kissinger, okay? Hillary, Hillary is great friends with Henry Kissinger, he's not my friend. And Henry Kissinger, no, no stranger to uh, meddling. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, particularly in the Iran case, uh, you know, the, the Iran hostage crisis, which scarred America so deeply and is still motivating anger toward Iran, was set off when the United States accepted the Shah into the United States for medical treatment, which the Iranians feared was a replay of 1953 to put him back on the throne. Right. Why did Jimmy Carter make that decision, despite the fact that his own diplomats in Tehran had cabled him saying, don't do this, they're gonna come in and take over the embassy. It's because Henry Kissinger, at the request of his boss, David Rockefeller, came to Carter and demanded that he do, did it and do it. And he went to the Kennedy School, Kissinger, and made a speech saying, we cannot treat this wonderful old ally of ours like a flying Dutchman. And he bludgeoned Clint, Carter into taking the Shah. And that's what set off this whole thing. So thanks a lot, Mr. Kissinger, for our present dilemma in Iran. Uh, no, let's give him the Nobel. Give him another Nobel. Let's give him another one. It's, yeah, it's interesting because Carter had Brzezinski, who, who was kind of I mean, why, why, you know, Carter, Carter strikes me as a decent human being. I mean, as, and probably one of the reasons why he was on, only got one term as president. Um, they didn't have to assassinate him like they did Kennedy, but they pretty much politically assassinated him. And, and you the, were the right, whole though. hostage deal. You're right to bring up Brzezinski. I think that was Clinton, well, that was Carter's downfall in foreign policy. Brzezinski came out of this background in Eastern Europe, brought up with this, her deep passion to destroy Russia, to hate Russians, to get back at Russia for everything they had done to his ancestors and to Eastern Europe and to Russians. And when he saw the Russian incursion into Afghanistan, he didn't see it from the perspective of American security, in which case he might have said, go ahead, let them sink into the quicksand like everybody before. But he wanted to plunge the United States in there as a way to seek revenge against the Russians. And he's the guy that got Jimmy Carter to do that. Uh, and I'll tell you a little follow-up story about this. When I was writing my book about the Iran coup, All the Shah's Men, um, I wanted to go and interview Jimmy Carter. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had really one question for him, which was, when you agreed to admit the Shah into the United States for medical treatment, did you realize what had happened in 1953, that the same Shah had fled the country and then CIA agents working in the basement of the U.S. Embassy organized a coup to bring him back and that they might imagine that the same thing was happening again? So I called somebody that is close to Carter and uh, he gave me the name of the person to telephone if you want to interview Carter, but he said, what do you want to ask him about? And I said, I want to ask him about Iran. He said, oh, he's not going to talk to you. So I said, well, okay, I call anyway. And I called anyway, and no, Carter didn't have time to answer me. And as I thought about it later, 
I realized that he probably did the right thing not to talk to me because if, think about that question. Either answer is terrible. So when you admitted the Shah, did you know what happened in 1953? If you say no, this is unforgivable, that you didn't even understand the history of the country. If you say yes, and you did it anyway, that's almost as bad. bad so just as well to say to Kinzer, I'm sorry, I'm busy. Uh, I'm cleaning, cleaning my sock drawer for the next 10 years. I'm doing Sunday school down in Georgia on a peanut farm. So what do you think about what Jimmy Carter has done um, with respect to Israel since his presidency? I think, I think he's made great strides. What, what, what do you think? Jimmy Carter, I think, goes down as our greatest ex-president. We can argue about what he did when he was president, uh, but he has really devoted himself to good causes. Um, he's speaking out. Uh, I have tremendous admiration for, for what he's doing. And uh, I think he's been a little bit written off by the uh, political establishment when he makes statements like, the United States is the most warlike country in the world. Well, it would seem to be pretty obvious. There's no other country that wages wars everywhere in the world. We have 800 foreign military bases, and the whole rest of the world combined doesn't even have 5% that number. Right. So that would be self-evident, but just by pointing it out, he becomes kind of stigmatized. He's weak and he's soft, he and he, but he's telling the truth. We are a warlike state. We are, yeah. And uh, we have to face that and decide whether this is what we want to be or what we don't want to be. George Washington warned against all of this in his famous farewell speech. Um, told us not to make permanent alliances with other countries, not to get involved in foreign quarrels. But uh, the most poignant line in that speech comes at the very end when he says, uh, Essentially, I know you're not going to listen to me. Yeah. You're not going to do what I say. You're going to put me on the $1 bill and call it a and day. Forget it. Yeah. It. Yeah, it's interesting because you have figures like, um, you know, Justin Amash, who's in Congress currently, and then before that, you know, Congressman Ron Paul. Um, obviously, when he ran in 2008 in that primary, you look at the way he got treated by, like, Rudy Giuliani, Newt Gingrich, Romney, um, yet he was right. Well, you know, we have this sense in America now that war is... Normal. War is like oxygen. Well, it's part of the economy. It's, I mean, war it, is that's eternal. why they call it the industrial complex, right? War is inevitable. It's not a contingency to choose um, among various other options. It's the inevitable necessity. And I, I don't think Americans of previous generations grew up with this understanding that to be American meant to be a citizen of a country that's constantly at war. And in presidential campaigns, you never hear discussion about peace. How do we achieve peace? It's always, how are you going to crush Venezuela? How are we going to get rid of the mullahs in Iran? Should we bomb them? Should we just sanction them? Should we invade them? Should we occupy them? How are we going to crush uh, the, the regime in Syria? What are we going to do about Libya? You never t get a discussion about how are we going to calm situations, withdraw our troops, to tranquilize the world. Uh, and in, in Washington, there's no percentage ever for thinking or suggesting that America should do a little bit less militarily in the world. You only get points for wanting to do more militarily than everybody Who's else. Who's going to be the you. toughest one? Yeah, it, it's, it's kind of psychotic, isn't it? I, I don't know that there's really going any back from it. Uh, going I do back think from that it it's uh, not just political. You're, you're right. I think it's a psycho well, psychological even, yeah. thing that has gotten into the American mind. Uh, we, we believe that uh, not only we have the right to interfere all over the world, but actually this will be good for everybody and the world and everyone out there secretly is actually waiting for they us. They want to it, do yeah. That. It's like divine providence. The thing, the, the, one of the reasons I continue to talk about this, I, I'm 33. Um, for me, my, you know, obviously Iraq, what the Iraq war happened uh, when I was in high school and a lot of people I know uh, ended up signing up to the military. I have friends who served in Iraq. I have a friend who's in the Marines right now um, who, who last I heard was in Japan, but because of what's going on, could be sent to Iran or to Iraq, well, to Iraq for now. Um, but for me, really, what, what really gets me is the fact that we have young people in the military who weren't even born when 9-11 happened and when we were talking about first going into Iraq. Well, almost, 2002, so that's, yeah, an 18-year-old in, in this year if may not have even have been born when people like Joe Biden, mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton, John Kerry, um, John Edwards and all these other shills were talking, were, were giving, believing the Bush administration. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say that they believe the lies or they were misled or they were only giving the president consent um, to, to, to be tough with Iraq. So we have young people now who are 18 years old, 17 going on 18, who can join the military and go fight and die, who weren't even born when all this began. And it just seems to be complete craziness to me. And I can't wrap my head around it. Yeah, if the Iraq war were 
a person, it, would, it could have a driver's license by now. <laughs> That's how long. Could smoke going cigarettes or, or vape? Maybe not anymore. Actually, not in New Hampshire. You got to be 21 now to vape. Okay, well, Thanks, we'll... President Trump. Keep, keep a couple of more years going on that war, and it'll be able to vape too. And drink, uh, yeah. What I. Uh, when I think about when I look back at all those people that supported the Iraq War so uh, enthusiastically, um, is not simply that they made a misjudgment, but that they don't seem to have learned anything from it. They're, They're not apologetic. Still They're still sp Kerry is still spinning it for Biden. That's you're absolutely well, Joe right. Joe Biden uh, didn't believe he didn't really he, he, mean it. he was against it. I was busy getting Botox, but he was against the war, and I gave a great speech against it. But I did vote for it. It's like the double speak, the Orwellian double speak. And I think that's even worse that, than sticking own to it, your just vote. Own it, just own it. Because Lindsey Graham, exactly, he, 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 exactly. Lindsey Graham wants to nuke. We were still he wants to nuke so bad, yeah. but he's unabashed about it. So we got to give him. We got to give him props for that. Uh, so, so we're going to kill all of them, Steve. We're going to kill every single one of them. Right. I'm going to look so good doing it. You know, I also have this idea that uh, before people can announce that they favor bombing or attacking Iran, my, my fantasy is to interrupt a speech by some congressman or senator that's doing that and bring him up an outline map of the world and say, can you please point to Iran on this map? Oh, a lot of them probably it couldn't. It should be a rule that you can't bomb any country that you can't find on a map. Is that too much that's to That's a great point. Yeah, so the, the Strait of Hormuz, um, like you, you know, you mentioned before, a lot of people, you know, who want to be involved in that part of the world probably couldn't even find it on the map or understand the implications of, of that being choked off. So the Strait of Hormuz is where a lot of the world's oil supply goes through. Nowadays, not quite as much as before. Um, but it's also a place where the United States has inserted its military. We have warships up and down that very narrow strait. If we wanted to avoid conflict, we would be trying to pull some of our naval assets out of the Strait of Hormuz. Instead, we pour more in, essentially in the hope that somehow this will spark some kind of an incident that we can then use as an excuse for whatever we want to do next to punish. They shot our drone down, Stephen. That was my drone. Melania gave that to me for Christmas. It was mine. You do that pretty well. Pretty well. My brother does it better, but but uh, yeah, no. But that's basically it's like goading goading them into uh, exactly. further es escalation. And, and and anyone who's been paying attention to this stuff, um, you know, obviously what happened with the tankers in that region, the uh, what were they Japanese uh, mm -hmm. ships and and you know, I ran, I ran, Iran will say the American drone was in our sovereign territory. We say no, it was in international territory. So it's like it's almost like a Gulf of Tonkin. Type thing. I could take it even further back. Look at 1898 and the explosion of the USS Maine in Havana Harbor. We sent a warship there with no particular reason, just to sit there and watch. It exploded. We later found out it was an accident, but at the time, it was blamed on the enemy, and it was used as the reason to go to war with Spain. So the more military assets you have pushing right up against somebody else's uh, face, the more likelihood there is there'll be a spark. And if you want a spark, which we do, that's why you pour all these assets in there. So Trump ran in 2016 um, against, you know, the Iraq war. He, I mean, he, he, he totally punked Jeb Bush. Um, he ran against Hillary Clinton's foreign policy. Uh, the, the breadth of Trump's foreign policy at that point was a quote on Howard Stern. Maybe, maybe we should be in there, maybe we shouldn't be in there, but either way, I would have taken the oil, okay? I'm gonna take the oil, believe me, I'm gonna take it. Now, uh, 2020, what would you say to his supporters um, you know, about his, his posturing and his actions with respect to the Middle East, with Afghanistan, with Iraq, with Iran. Sure, there were some promises kept in the campaign, but that was a major one that he ran against. And I, I've pointed this out to a lot of big Trump people, Trump supporters. You've you got to be honest about it. So, yeah, I, I How do you that, reach them? Uh, Trump's campaign in uh, 2016, I think, did give some people hope that he saw foreign policy in a different way. I, 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 liked, I liked some of the stuff he said, I have to admit it. I did too, and I, I thought it was a breath of fresh air, especially contrasted to everything we had known about Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, I think all the hopes that uh, Trump actually had a coherent alternative idea about American foreign policy have evaporated. Now it turns out that the power of that Washington establishment to suck people in I just claimed another victim. The same thing happened with Obama. A lot of people came in with great hopes for Obama foreign policy, and he hadn't been in there a period of months before he was starting to mouth the same aggressive platitudes. Same thing has happened uh, with Trump. He, he said all the right things during the campaign about what a waste of trillions of dollars our Middle East adventure was, and now he's continuing it. There are more troops from the United States military in the Middle East now 
than there were when Trump took over. When Trump came into office, the United States had no crisis with Iran. We were not in conflict with Iran. He's escalated, let's be honest. I mean, he, they, he made it worse. Bolton, Pompeo, they have totally escalated what's going on over there. So he has, he may have pleased some of the senators in Washington whose votes he needs for the impeachment uh, election, but uh, he has definitely disappointed any supporters of his who thought that his election might lead to a change in foreign policy. Yeah, because I think to his core, Trump's not really a war guy. I don't think he really wants to get a big war going, whether that's because um, he's, he thinks it will spare lives and it will be bad in that sense, or it will make him look bad. Whatever the reason is, I don't think he's actually like a big war guy. Um, but I, I think, like you're saying, he's going to be caving in to pressure from advisors around him. And I don't think he understands that some of the moves that his people are sandbagging him into taking are likely to produce war. By the time you get to where it's sometimes too late. Oh, the cat, yeah, the cat's out of the bag. You can't, it's like trying to put toothpaste back into the, into the tube. It's not going to happen. In international relations theory, we have this idea called off-ramps. When you're heading toward a crisis, you should always allow for off-ramps for each side. We're not giving Iran any off-ramps. We don't want them to have off-ramps. We just want them to crash and burn. Rand Paul talks about the off-ramps, and he, he, he's not seeing many right now either. And I think he's one of the few Republican senators who have a voice of reason um, with foreign policy that, that has Trump's ear a little bit. I mean, they golf together, you know, they, uh, he gets to meet with them sometimes. So he's definitely playing that game, but I, I think he should listen to a figure like Rand Paul a little bit more. I, maybe maybe send him over there. I don't know. Him, him and Jimmy Carter, who knows? I uh, write a column in the Boston Globe, and it's been already like a year or two since I wrote a column suggesting Ron Paul, uh, Rand Paul should be Secretary of State yeah, under, under Trump. Trump. Then we would see something different. Absolutely. All right, so we're going to leave Iran. We're going to, we're going to uh, uh, shift to your new book, uh, Poisoner in Chief. All, would you call it a biography about yes. Dr. Gottlieb? Mm -hmm. so, so Sidney Gottlieb, um, in your estimate, is probably one of the most uh, famous yet unknown and in infamous figures that had power over the last 60 years in America that no one really knows about but, but has been influenced by. So this guy, Sidney Gottlieb, who is the uh, subject of my new book, I, I now believe was the most powerful unknown American of the 20th century. So he was in charge of this MK Ultra program, which was the CIA search for techniques of mind control. Uh, he decided that in order to figure out a way to control people's minds, the first thing you had to do was find a way to destroy the mind that was already in there. So he supervised experiments over four continents aimed at finding ways to destroy human minds and bodies and spirits with massive overdoses of drugs and electroshocks and sensory deprivation and all kinds of other gruesome techniques. He carried out the harshest and most extreme experiments on human beings that have ever been conducted by any agent or official of the U.S. government. Who, how many people died under his tortures? We don't know. In the end, he was finally forced to conclude after 10 years that actually mind control is a myth and you can't make a Manchurian candidate. But behind him, he left such a path of bodies and suffering. To me, it's amazing that this happened. You know, this is my 10th book. I've discovered a lot of things that are surprising in my previous books and they may have shocked other people, but this is the first time I've been shocked. And now I ask myself, if a project like MKUltra, which I describe in gruesome detail in my book, could have happened in the 1950s, nobody being aware of it, what could be happening now when technology is so much further advanced, medical science and the money available is so much uh, more widely distributed? So it makes me think that uh, Although I discovered this odd figure from the 1950s whose uh, influence is still being felt today in the techniques used at Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo, what might be out there today that we don't know about? I'm waiting for another Kinzer in 50 years to write that book. If I'm around, I'll write the book. Deal. Uh, if I, I got to cut back on my beer. But um, yeah, no, Gottlieb, I mean, just reading about him, it's weird because he, he's, he's just, you describe him at least as almost like a... Uh, you know, son of Jewish immigrants, hippie type figure, soft spoken, ha got up in the morning and dealt with cattle and gardening and planting vegetables and w maybe would be like a fun dude to hang out with. Uh, on the, conversely, he himself d did LSD, what, several hundred times and then unknown and, and gave to people without their consent. 
LSD, whether it's in their drink or, or in, a, in what they thought was a medical or, or an experiment at a college. I mean, at, like, what's the, du the duality of that? It's true. God, Gottlieb had the Jekyll and Hyde thing going in a big way. Uh, you're absolutely right about LSD, too. Uh, so Gottlieb was the first acid visionary. He's the guy who brought LSD to the United States. In 1953, Gottlieb, he, he became obsessed with LSD. He thought this could be, as one of his assistants put it, the key to unlocking the universe, mm -hmm. so the key to mind control. So in 1953, he persuaded the CIA to buy the entire world supply of LSD and bring it to the United States. And he used it for two purposes. One was for some of these grotesque and horrific experiments in which people were given massive overdoses for weeks on end without being told what was happening to them. But he also wanted to know how did LSD uh, go down with ordinary people under clinical conditions. Sure. So he decided to set up uh, experiments, but he couldn't conduct them himself. The CIA doesn't have hospitals. So he set up a couple of bogus medical foundations that would approach hospitals and clinics and tell them, uh, we've got this new psychoactive drug. We would like you to call for volunteers and pay them a modest amount to come in tell them what's happening and try it and then just write down what happens. So who turned up as among the very first volunteers? Ken Kesey, author of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. He loved LSD so much. Not only did he, take, did he get his friends to come in and try it, but he got a job in the hospital where he got all of his ideas for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. But as I was doing my research, I discovered, he later admitted, he didn't get the job in the hospital for that reason. He got it because he wanted to steal the LSD and bring it home and have parties. Allen Ginsberg, the poet, oh, sorry, he's poet. another one. He got his LSD first from Sidney Gottlieb. Robert Hunter, the, the uh, songwriter for The Grateful Dead, yeah. got it from Sidney Gottlieb, brought it home, turned on The Grateful Dead. He was admitted CIA. He just died recently. All I mean, those, all of those people were the conduits by which Gottlieb's LSD leaked out into the public eye. And, and uh, John Lennon was later asked about this and he said, about LSD, and he said, uh, we must always remember to thank the CIA. So the irony, of course, is that the drug that He knew Gottlieb, that back then to say that. He knew it. Right? Yeah, well, he didn't know Gottlieb because Gottlieb he was a secret. He probably didn't know Gottlieb, yeah. But People in the CIA didn't know exactly, Gottlieb. Exactly. Nobody knew who he was. But right. the irony is that the drug that Gottlieb thought would give the CIA the power to control human minds actually wound up fueling a generational rebellion which was aimed at destroying everything the CIA believes in. Yeah, that's crazy that so like a, a square guy, you know, wearing, wearing his white tucked in shirt, you know, going in with his briefcase in the office is, is, is basically interfacing with these hippies and these counterculture figures. But don't you think, though, that drugging the masses through LSD and promoting that, like the acid test that like the Grateful Dead were part of in the Haight-Ashbury scene, um, don't you think part of that was, yeah, they wanted to see how they're going to respond, but also if we turn them into a deadhead or someone who's kind of all geeked out and not really questioning anything, they can be more easily manipulated. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean I a lot of the 60s counterculture stuff, I mean, it, 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 se it kind of seems a little bit manufactured in, in that way. I, I see where you're coming from. You know, I see it now, uh, for example, I used to like Jack Kerouac on the road. Now I'm seeing him so self-absorbed, so uninterested in the world around him. It's all about me, 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 and now how I'm feeling, how I'm thinking. These, a lot of people who became counterculture heroes, I think, also did get sucked into that culture where you drop out. And, of course, dropping out is exactly what the people who are waging these wars all over the world and, and administering an unjust system in the United States want you to do. Yeah, they don't want you to pay attention. They want you to be in this own, this little vortex. Oh, it's, inter it's an interesting uh, con contrast because really, I think, in my opinion, the last real anti-war, organic anti-war movement was during the Vietnam era. And, and it may be a little bit in, into the lead up of Iraq, but it's, it's since dissipated. Once Obama got in there, it, it dissipated. There, there's no real cohesive central anti-war movement in this country anymore you're right you know and I, I think that had a lot to do with it i think doping a lot of those young people and getting them to go off on you know tangents during the summer of love or or whatever it was i'll tell you but, what i think another factor is and it's the abolition of the draft 
Now, I'm still old enough to remember when we had a draft in this country and everybody was scared. If we're going to go to war, sure. I might have to go. Sure. I personally was listening my draft number. I couldn't wait to see what was going to happen. Am I going to have to go? Do I have to get killed? Do I have to kill people? Or am I going to get a number that means I'm not going to have to go? Now, nobody has to think about that. It doesn't affect us. So I feel like actually a counter instinctively, if we reinstated the draft and exposed all young Americans to the possibility of having to go to war, we'd be much likely, less likely to go. Right, they might pay attention to it a little bit more. And I think they should send anyone who votes for the war, send their kin first. Well, send I'm sure Jared, there, the the Jared's on his way with Donald Jr. He's training right now at Quantico, and it's going very well. He has bone started. spurs, but I can't remember what foot they're in. Well, me and BB are putting him through a pretty rigorous process right now, believe me. Believe me. So another war that we are kind of involved in through proxy is, of course, with Saudi Arabia and their proxy war with Yemen. Um, where do you think that's heading? Uh, the Saudi war in Yemen is, is just so, it's such a, so awful, and it really doesn't have any reason to go on other than just ego and Saudi Arabia trying to throw its weight around. And frankly, I hate what Saudi Arabia is doing in Yemen, but... I don't think the United States has to react every time, some, every time something's going on in the world that I hate. But I don't want to be involved. If Saudi Arabia wants to blow up buses and kill children in Yemen, I hate that. But I don't need to be part of it. I just don't want the United States to be supplying the targeting information and supplying the weapons, the weapons and the helicopters. Yeah. It's picking and choosing. I mean, we're involved with 70% of the world's quote-unquote bad people, terrorists, you know. They put it on Fox News that can call someone a terrorist or label them an enemy combatant, and then we just have to go along with it. So it, it's I, just like a, it just repeats itself. I hear the line all the time about Iran being the number one state sponsor of terrorists yeah. by people yeah. who then go to Saudi Arabia and hug the people that paid off the 9-11 hijackers. Well, yeah, how about Mike Pence saying now, trying to link 9-11 and Iran? How, how ridiculous is that? Well, you know, you maybe two of the 9-11 hijackers lived, would live with an FBI informant out in San Diego. In the American mind, uh, I think the idea is uh, these Muslims are capable of anything. And I think the idea that the Al-Qaeda people and the ISIS people hate Iran. They want to destroy Iran. And that Iran is devoted above all to protecting itself by fighting ISIS and Al-Qaeda anywhere in the neighborhood so they don't come into Iran. Once we understand that, I think we understand that Iran is actually a better likely partner for us than some of our so-called friends in the Middle East. If you ever go to Iran, also you'll see the society there looks so much like ours. Right. Whereas the society in some other countries like Saudi Arabia does not look anything you, you like wouldn't that. have any fun over there. Would we be able to have beer openly over there? Well, I think Maybe we would. Certainly a woman wouldn't be able anybody, to without company of her husband. Anybody or, who wants to uh, bomb or sanction Iran should be required to go and spend a few days there. I truly think absolutely. Iran is really the most misunderstood country in the world, certainly in the United States. And I can understand why. We haven't had a diplomat in Iran for more than 40 years. We have no official knowledge of Iran. And the experts in the U.S. who really know Iran are never called upon to share their expertise because they're going to come out on the wrong side. Yeah, I mean, Iran is a population of, what was it, 80 70 million? 70 million, 70 million people, and a lot of which are under the age of 30. Um, uh, in a lot of ways, they're pro-West pro in, in, in em emulating our lifestyle, yeah. and they want to have uh, nice things for their family. These aren't you know, savages and tents, which is unfortunately, I think, what a lot of, a lot of your American, your average American citizens, they think of Iran, they think of terrorists, they think of savages, and, and that's, that's the view that's been drilled into our head. So, I, I don't know how, how do you, how do you uh, change course on that and get people to understand that they're, they're a sovereign country and they, they have never attacked us, they pose no threat to our homeland, and um, you know we shouldn't, shouldn't be meddling over there. Well. How do we get people to change their impressions? Uh, all I can do is give you this one observation. In the last three, two or three weeks since the Soleimani assassination, the sales of my book, All the Shah's Men, have skyrocketed. Oh, yeah. I think, other than the arms makers, I might be the only one who's really benefited from <laughs> oh, this crisis. Hey, good. I'll, I'll drink Everybody to that. You're telling the truth about it. Let's do yeah, it. Let's just have a, have a drink to that. Jeez. All right, I'm going, to close, I'm going to close on Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the whole Epstein deal based on, on you know, your, your research or your background? or what, what, do you, what do you think about that whole deal? Well, I don't have any more knowledge than any of the people that are watching us or listening to us right now. 
But my background in having spent decades studying about what happens behind the facade of public diplomacy and politics that we can see leads me to be naturally skeptical. Um, uh, it, everything seems to come together so perfectly. Uh, so is it a closed case? Not in my mind. I would agree, absolutely. There, there's a lot of information out there and I would encourage everybody to look at it. So, all right, folks, there you have it. Professor Stephen Kinzer, thank you so much. It's been a, an honor and a pleasure. Uh, ever since I read Overthrow in College, that's, that's helped shape my worldview on foreign policy. And I thank you for that and, uh, you know, for, for helping me be skeptical and, and to question everything. So, Well, thanks for inviting me to a brewery. Absolutely. Cheers. Episode 7, Politics and Pints. Uh, thank you to uh, Post and Bean Brewing here in Peterborough, New Hampshire. And please subscribe to Jackman Radio on YouTube. And check out Professor Stephen Kinzer's work, his new book, uh, Poisoner in Chief, The Search for Dr. Sidney Gottlieb. Sidney Gottlieb and the CIA Search for Mind Control. There you go, folks. You heard it. Cheers. <laughs>